Want to know a secret? The real reason that gaming during the 80s and 90s was so magical, why we still can't stop playing the classics today and get so nostalgic over things like old game cartridges, print magazines, and classic arcades. Yes, the games were incredible, with the birth of nearly every popular franchise we continue to play. But the games are only part of the story. Think about what else you loved about that era. Movies that fueled your imagination. Famous comic arcs that made you dream big. Morning cartoons that had you glued to the TV. Dungeons and Dragons on weekends. Riding your bike clear across town to the game store just to get a glimpse of what new games they had. So much was exciting and the memories we created, now over 30 years later, still haven't been forgotten. Whether teaming up with friends to take down Magneto, or leaving them behind to die under the waterfall, being a kid was both wonderful and messy, as it should be. We shared our love of games and talked trash. Whether standing shoulder to shoulder at Street Fighter cabinets, or elbow to groin on the basketball court, argued over console superiority, only to then bring our stash of games with us for weekend sleepovers so we could all share and play them together, or at least let them watch. It wasn't just about about the games, or movies, or any one thing. It was the connections we created while enjoying them together. Not that we didn't play alone, we sure did, late into the night, when we could get away with it. Some of my greatest triumphs were on my own, but it was always followed with sharing that triumph with others the next day. It's that sense of community and shared passions we had that created the magic. What kid were you? The one with all the magazines that everyone wanted to come over and read? The one with the rare, unique system that nobody else in the neighborhood had and others came over to play? The one with the parents who made all the amazing food and would feed you and your friends whenever you were over? The game master that others would bring their games to needing help or just watch with excitement and envy as you conquered farther into a game they just couldn't complete? Did you grow up in a country where Sega, not Nintendo, ruled the roots during the post-Atari 8-bit generation? Or were you the computer geek, cobbling together your own PCs and playing games like Wolf 3D, Wing Commander, Eye of the Beholder, and Monkey Island, upgrading RAM and sound cards to play the latest? We were mesmerized by new technology, quickly becoming bigger, badder, better, and often not very affordable. Most had to choose a side, then draw our lines in the sand, and defend that choice with our honor, if it was even our choice to begin with. So sharing our games, systems, and everything else was a matter of necessity, even if sometimes borrowed games quietly became part of someone else's library. Imagine an era where nearly all of gaming's classic franchises were born, when legendary developers like Konami, Capcom, Taito, SNK, Hudson Soft, Sega, and Nintendo created popular characters and experiences that remain iconic today. The very first Contra that had us practicing the Konami code, trying to finish it co-op with a friend. The unforgiving brutality of the original Castlevania, no codes or passwords, starting over from the beginning until you finally figured out the tricks to beating some of its hardest bosses, finding the best route through the original Mega Man to make reaching and fighting each boss manageable with the best weapon, or the engrossing adventure of the original Zelda and Metroid games with the ability to save your game and slowly progress, even take it on the road and play with friends. Never forget opening the original Final Fantasy box for the first time and uncovering a full size, color map of the world that I was about to spend nearly a hundred hours exploring. Mario went from a single screen arcade style score fest to an action platformer, then to a full fledged adventure of its own with a map and endless secrets to uncover. 
Some of the home ports turned out even better than their arcade originals. Ninja Gaiden went from a beat-em-up to one of the greatest action platformers of all time. Known for its split-second timing and unforgiving difficulty, Bionic Commando became a full-fledged adventure with branching paths, story, and a bloody fantastic surprise ending that Nintendo's American censors <laughs> clearly missed. The very foundation of what console gaming would become started here, and playing games of this depth and caliber for the first time ever was nothing short of a revelation. Although sometimes, nothing short of a trip to hell and back, because a lot of these games were maddeningly hard. Designed to give our parents their money's worth, and a can full of whoop-ass to us, we had to cut our teeth on some of the most brutal games, and living to tell the tale was a badge of honor. More importantly, those of us that persevered through some of the era's hardest and their trial-by-fire experience prepared us for a lifetime of challenging gaming. Of course, it didn't hurt to have a little help from great magazines with tips and tricks to fall back on, strategy, maps and walkthroughs, and even cheat codes. Playing with power meant playing with an advantage, because Lord knows we needed it. And when all else failed and hope seemed lost, it was the latest issue arriving in the mail, or guide hidden at the newsstand, ready with a strategy that would show us the way. No other console generation can lay claim to launching the vast majority of famous franchises like the 8-bit systems from Nintendo and Sega. Sega! The early 90s took gaming to the next level, and unlike the 8-bit years, the competition was fierce, with both Sega and Nintendo pulling out all the marketing stops in their war. No matter which side you chose, blast processed, or playing with superpower, you had an amazing library of games to choose from that upped the ante in every way. But what's often lost in all the console war reporting is that it wasn't really a war at all. At least, not like today's culture. Yes, it was a competition. Like the Lakers versus the Celtics. Or the Bulls and the Knicks. We got into it, compared stats, and gloated when our port was the best. But at the end of the day, we were cool. We all played each other's games and systems. No matter which console you owned, you weren't missing out on the rival games and playing them too. And hot damn was there a lot to play. <music> Nintendo had the best RPGs and adventure games. One of the best, Contra, Castlevania, Zelda, and Mario games of all time. When it came to gorgeous pixel art and system-exclusive killer apps, Nintendo was hard to beat. From your grave. Sega had the best arcade ports and action games, not to mention a sports behemoth, and a heck of a lot of shoot 'em ups, too. Some of the best of the generation. Killer exclusives like Treasure's Gunstar Heroes, not to mention its own Contra and Castlevania sequels, the Shinobi games, and some of the best co-op experiences around. Even the TurboGrafx-16, which failed to take hold in the US but exploded in Japan, including over a hundred shooters to enjoy. And if you were lucky enough to have a friend that owned one, you got to play that library of shooting games too, along with the greatest Castlevania of the generation and other incredible CD games, the very first of their kind. Over half the console's Japanese library, more than 370 games out of nearly 700, were on CD. <music> 
or if you were really lucky. You actually had a friend with a Neo Geo, or even owned one yourself. Most of us, we could only dream of such a thing. And to top it all off, we also had arcades. What was your favorite arcade game? The one special cabinet you just couldn't pass by without tossing in a quarter. Was it a fighter, a platformer, a beat-em-up, or a shooting game? Did you play it with friends? Anyone that grew up during this era knows that arcade cabinets were everywhere. Not the generic, big box arcades of today, but all unique spaces. Along with every plaza, liquor store, laundromat, and pizza parlor. If there was a free corner, you can bet there were some cabinets. Many of the most popular games slowly found their way home. But arcades were more than just a way to socialize and play games together. They were a place of wonder and discovery, where you'd wander into your local hotspot, not only to find your favorites, but with an anticipation of what cool new games have been added. The very first time seeing and playing Capcom Strider was a near transcendent experience, with a creativity of stage layouts and gameplay never experienced before. Jumping into the pilot seat of Afterburner, a freaking amusement park ride of a game, with visuals and kinetic gameplay impossible to match at home, ultra-wide, multi-screen, multiplayer beat-em-ups of our favorite cartoons or comics, and of course, shooting games. The genre that literally blew open the market with Space Invaders, but now cranked to 11 with some brutally tough yet engrossing games like Gradius, R-Type, and Flying Shark, classics that would influence the genre for the next decade. And while popular in the West, it was Japan where they thrived most, where arcades were filled with shooters of every kind and long lines waiting to play them. There was no other genre that better distilled that essence of arcade gaming as friends and strangers gather round, seemingly in awe of the mastery on display. There was nothing else like it, and once you'd been hooked, there was no going back. Every trip to a new arcade was the possibility of a killer new game being found. Games so numerous and often obscure that many are still being discovered today that had previously been lost to time. Yes, arcades were amazing and again, a magical part of the era. A magic that like all good things, couldn't last forever. As the 32-bit generation kicked into high gear and home ports began to replicate the arcade so accurately, playing at home was both convenient and cheaper. And as new genres like the first-person shooter emerged, the arcade experience was slowly left behind and faded away. Where there once stood a Street Fighter cabinet, now just an ATM machine, where we once gathered to play games for hours was replaced by a mattress store. And with those arcades gone, so was a part of our childhood. Great music was the soundtrack to our lives, making the ordinary extraordinary. And boy did the 80s and 90s have some incredible music. We grew up with Michael Jackson, Madonna, Def Leppard, Aerosmith, and Metallica. No matter how good the movie or how great the game, the soundtrack provided the atmosphere and personality. And in the gaming scene, it was the start of our love affair with chiptunes. Just hearing any of these classic melodies instantly brings back memories of not only the game itself, but the times we shared playing them. Every console had their own signature sound, which any of us could pick out in a heartbeat without ever seeing the game. Shoot 
shooters played a prominent role, with classics like Gradius and Thunder Force having some of the most memorable soundtracks in gaming history. We were also there for the advent of CD games, which just blew our mind with the music and compositions suddenly possible, enthralling us for a time with the new technology. The PC Engine was the first console out of the gate, producing some of the most memorable CD game soundtracks of the era. But once the dust had settled and CD became the norm, many of us still pined for the programmed chiptunes of old and those earworm melodies they produced. was a snapshot of the early years and to this day holds far too many memories to ever forget. What makes one a gaming junkie? Is it simply a passion for the art and entertainment? Or was there more behind the scenes? The answer is complicated. For many, gaming was simply that, enjoying them in every way we could, an exciting new medium to explore that was finally coming into its own. It was fun, and it was a healthy part of our lives. But with all the nostalgia and hindsight, it's also easy to lose perspective and imagine a perfect golden age where all was right with the world. Of course, that's impossible. Childhood was, and is, as much about learning painful lessons and growing as it is fun in games. And for many, games weren't just a passion, but also an escape. An escape from the trials of childhood. Games became a matter of survival, a way to disappear into an engaging fantasy world that at least temporarily relieved our suffering. A way to become the hero or heroine of your own imagination. While truly memorable, the 80s and 90s weren't always kind to kids. Being a nerd or a bookworm wasn't cool yet, but many of us were. What happens when games become more than just games? When they become a way to save us from our own childhood traumas? And don't kid yourself, no pun intended. We all had them in one way or another. How many were bullied on the playground, so they disappeared into gaming the moment they came home, suppressing that rage that comes with being picked on? The games themselves told us that winners don't do drugs, and the war against them was at its height. Society hadn't yet accepted that the drugs weren't the problem, but simply another escape and a way to feel normal. There are so many ways that we used games to cope, to find common ground and connections, or simply to survive. For some, games became an addiction, and in turn, we became junkies. I often ask myself, why do I truly collect so many games? Sure, there are a handful that are true nostalgia, but so many? How many simply own the games? Just sitting on display, or do you feel alone in your hobby? What are some of us saying with our collections, with our posts on Instagram or Twitter? Yes, we're sharing a passion, but I see something deeper. What I see is a yearning for connection that was lost when we grew up. The child in us saying, hey, check out my games, come over, play with me. Because it's not just the games that we need, it's each other, the connections that we've lost. And no amount of games alone can bring it back. So what happened next? We grew up, of course, but not before riding through the most technically innovative era of the last few decades. The next generation didn't just bring arcade accurate ports, but true polygonal gaming and vast 3D worlds that we'd never imagined possible. Adventures became more epic, horror more realistic, 
sometimes a little too much so, and portable gaming became as important as playing at home. The console race went from two or three to several competitors. Games became a global force to be reckoned with. Now, there were losses along the way. Sega faltered and was eventually pushed out of the market, and their incredible innovation went with them. Shooting games lost popularity, first becoming a niche market for the most hardcore of players, and then nearly disappeared altogether. The very best developers, whose games and sequels we once agonized to play, closed their doors and made way for a new market and style of gaming. Time marched on, and change was inevitable. All that's changed and what was lost. Today, we find ourselves in another golden age, a modern age that's made rekindling memories of our childhood a reality. Companies like Sega, Natsume, and Tatsujin Corp are making a comeback, bringing back classic games, and releasing sequels that do the originals justice. Big boys like Capcom and Konami, who moved on and modernized long ago, often leaving us behind, are slowly coming around and putting resources back into the retro market. Indie developers, many like us who grew up during that era, are producing new games that often perfectly capture what made our old favorites so memorable, and doing it better than most AAA developers ever could. Even shooters have made a tremendous comeback, with old games and new being released at a record pace we haven't seen in decades. New games for our old 8 and 16-bit consoles, spearheaded by some of the legends of the industry. If you told me this would happen just years ago, I wouldn't have believed it. And it's not just the games that are back. Anything you miss can now be found. That trapper keeper from grade school, the garbage pail kids you collected, even the fake cigarette candy that they'd sell us out of the ice cream truck. <laughs> okay, let's be honest, that's just ridiculous. Our favorite cartoons and anime on streaming, the comics we read accessed from anywhere, even the transforming mask toys can be found if you look. Fire away, baby. Synthesized music that brings back the feels, being resurrected by talented artists like Zach Vortex, whose music you've been listening to featured in this video, creating a perfect atmosphere for those late nights working on the computer. These games, movies, toys, and more have value beyond a price. Whether they conjure joyful memories or remind you of painful ones, they were and are a part of our life. I'll say that again, our life, none of what we cherish most would amount to much if it wasn't for those we shared it with. Those are the connections that created the memories, the not-so-secret secret that created the magic. Share your passion with others, remember the past, but live in the present. Create new memories sharing your old favorites with a younger generation. And if you're ever feeling old, just remember how awesome a time it was to grow up. What an incredible time it was to game, and you'll remember why. You wouldn't give that up for the world. What would you little maniacs like to do first?